guys uh, to this uh, talk. This is the last talk in this room for today. So let's welcome Shane uh, Viterana from uh, Stargates. So Shane, all yours. Thank you. Hey guys, how's it going? So um, I'm Shane from Stargaze, and I am going to talk about MEV and NFT primary markets. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> So MEV in NFT primary markets. So what am I talking about here when I'm talking about MEV? So um, in this context, um, M uh, stands for Minter, uh, Minter Extractable Value. And um, when I'm talking about a primary market, I'm talking about um, the first sale between uh, the creator and the collector. So this is not about the secondary market, which is something like OpenSea where you have uh, bids and asks. This is only about MEV in the very first sale. And um, the minter uh, is the person um, in this case is minting the NFT for the first time. So just a note about um, MEV in Tendermint, uh, because Tendermint um, uses uh, an ordering of first in, first out, it, it eliminates a whole class of uh, MEV that you get in other blockchains where you have uh, priority gas uh, gas auctions. So in this case, MEV is only contained to uh, the NFT minting size and, and the order um, of the minting. So uh, to understand this a little better, uh, we first need to understand the anatomy of an NFT, which has both on-chain data and uh, off-chain data. <clears throat> So first, let's talk about the on-chain data. Now, um, the on-chain data um, is uh, in the NFT collection. In the case of Stargaze, uh, it's a SG721. And you have this mapping of token IDs and token URIs. Uh, the token URIs uh, is the metadata uh, uh, file that is stored um, on IPFS. Um, for a lot of the generative collections, like you see on, on Stargaze for like Star Chodes and Stargaze Punks and a bunch of all the uh, other collections, the way it's stored is that you have a base URL, um, which is a, a URL to the folder, and then you have um, a token ID. And every time you mint, it just goes to the next sequential token ID. Um, so that um, kind of long string of characters you see over there is the IPFS content ID. And this is basically a hash of the content. Um, so, so this is how content addressing on IPFS works. Um, so now if someone goes to IPFS and changes the data, it also changes uh, the link that the data points to. So this is how uh, you know if the data for the underlying NFT changed or not. Um, so on chain, you have a record um, of the IPFS content IDs that are um, uh, associated with with each token. So let's let's take an example. Let's look at an example of this, right? So this is um, Star Chode or Baby Chode uh, eighteen twenty nine. You have uh, the NFT on the left. Uh, you have the you have the metadata on the on, on the left side, and this is just a JSON file. Uh, it has a name, image, and then it has a bunch of attributes or traits. And you can kind of see the representation on the website on the right-hand side. So the traits is what gives the rarity for an NFT. Um, and, and, and this is how NFTs are typically valued. So for example, uh, in this NFT, you have uh, this baby chode has um, um, a head of an aqua mohawk and only 1% of um, NFTs in this collection um, have an aqua mohawk. Um, so this is represented in this uh, in this metadata. <clears throat> so um, anyone looking at this uh, can look at the whole collection, compile um, all the rarities, and figure out a rarity score um, for each NFT in this collection. So given that, 
the problem we have right now is sequential minting, right? So, so now if you go and mint an NFT, um, uh, you know, Ethereum also started this way. Um, it, it, the, you, you have a problem of sequential minting where um, every time you mint, it just increments the token ID by one, right? So let's break it down to like a very trivial case where you mint uh, one F NFT per block, right? So let's say that um, right now you're on block 4459 and someone minted baby chode 4459. Um, but by looking, uh, someone who's really savvy can look at IPFS and figure out um, that baby chode 4461 is incredibly rare, right? So uh, in this case, um, that that NFT has the highest rarity score. So knowing that, um, someone who's, sa who's savvy can wait for two blocks and then mint the exact NFT that they want and they can snipe it this way. So can the devs do something? How do we fix this problem? So I'm just going to kind of walk through um, a few of the solutions here. So they kind of ordered from uh, from easy to hard. Okay, um, IPFS submarining um, is one way to solve this problem. So the way this works is that um, a creator would uh, publish the the metadata to a private IPFS node, and um, because of content addressing, nothing has to change on the contract side. So they can go ahead and deploy this contract, but won't have to change any of the token. URLs because um, once this is published to a public node, it's going to be exactly the same, right? So first they publish it to a private node and then they do the minting, right? Then everyone comes and mints their NFTs. And then only afterwards do you publish it to a, pri uh, to, to, a, to, a to a public node, right? So this way um, the creator hides all the metadata and uh, there's no way for the minter uh, to know um, and, 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 and figure out which NFT they want uh, in, in order to snipe it. Now, uh, the advantages of this is that for the developer, they don't have to have to do, have to do a thing, right? This, is, this all kind of uh, falls in, into the hands of, of the creator. Um, the disadvantage of this is that um, the UX is worse, right? So... So now when, when the user mints, they don't get uh, to see what they got, got immediately, right? They have to wait until either a validator, some third party, or the creator themselves goes ahead and publishes the public version of the NFT. All right. And then reveal later is, um, is very similar, right? Instead of publishing to a private IPFS node first, uh, the creator goes ahead and publishes a placeholder collection uh, to IPFS. So generally, this is like a, some kind of animated GIF that just kind of rolls through a sampling um, of the NFTs in, in the collection. Um, then the user go, goes ahead and performs the mint. Um, and then when they do that, they just get, you know, this kind of like um, uh, random sample. It's not the real NFT that they minted. And then they have to wait for the creator to go and upload um, the real version of it and then they get the NFT, right? So uh, the advantage of this again is, uh, the, you know, the, the, um, the, the developer doesn't have to do anything, um, but the smart contract has to have the ability to go and update uh, the token URIs. Of course, the disadvantage to the user is that they have to wait until uh, the creator goes ahead and uploads the real, the real collection. Um, so what can we do? Can we make uh, the UX better so that um, the NFT is available um, as soon as the mint happens? So this can be solved um, using randomness and a shuffle and shuffling. Okay, so um, the way this works is that first you had to generate a random number. Um, the reason you need a random number is because it's an input into the shuffle algo. Uh, so in this case, we're using Fishery 8s, which is a, a well-known shuffling algorithm. Um, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to the randomness um, in a little bit because 
as some of you may know, is not trivial to generate a random number on a blockchain. Uh, is because you know every node would have to generate the same random number at the same time for it to work. So, um, so there's there's various approaches to solve solving that problem. Um, but this is the approach that Stargaze is taking, and uh, let me just go over this a little bit. So, first, when a collection is launched, um, it all the token IDs for that collection uh, is randomly shuffled. Okay, so that solves the sequential minting just a little bit because now you don't know um, exactly which one you're going to get next. But someone who's savvy can look into the blockchain and query the data and um, you know know which one still the, that that's going to be minted next. Um, so so this is you know better than just regular sequential minting. Uh, but but it adds uh, a bit of an extra extra element to it. So um, so you can't just do the single shuffle, right? You have to do 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 a little bit more than that. Um, so what we do is that on the, on the minting process, we do another smaller shuffle. So what this does is that it takes um, a range of token IDs either from the first uh, either from the front of the list or from the back back of the list. And that's going to be random, right? So you don't know if you're getting one from the front or the back. And then it does a secondary shuffle on the mint. And that's how, uh, that's how you get, that's how you get the NFT, right? So um, the reason uh, for not doing a full shuffle on each mint is because it's an expensive operation. So if you have um, a collection of 10,000, uh, you don't want to be shuffling that on every mint. Now, someone could still potentially um, figure out the order. Um, so you need another element to this, and that is having a shuffle function that anyone can call. When, when anyone can call the shuffle function, uh, it adds an element of time to it. Right, so now if someone's really savvy, they can figure out exactly what's going on inside the blockchain. They don't know that at, at uh, they don't know exactly what they're going to get next because anyone can come and call the shuffle function, um, uh, and 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 that randomizes the order again. Um, so anyone can call this, and generally, um, it's something that maybe whales can do, and 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 when whales call this function, they're kind of socializing the cost of it. And, um, you know, they're also kind of benefiting the blockchain at the same time. Uh, and the reason for this is, at least in the context of Stargaze, it has this uh, fee structure called fair burn. Uh, in fair burn, 50% of the fees are burned and 50% go to stakers, right? So when whales come and uh, do the shuffle, um, they're, they're actually, uh, you know, helping the network in two ways. They're helping to randomize the collections and they're also... Um, you know, potentially increasing the value of the token and and also uh, you know distributing fees to all the stakers. Um, so this is this is kind of neat. So um, I mentioned earlier that getting randomness um, on a blockchain is non-trivial. Um, well, one way to do it is to use a, a service called DRAND. Uh, DRAND is run by a consortium of companies, I believe, and they generate um, a random number every 30 seconds. Now, now, blockchains can't talk to the outside world, right? They can't just use the API for DRAND and get a random number. Um, so, so the way this has to work is that some external party has to submit the randomness to the chain, right? So let's say you have... Um, a smart contract, um, you know, in our case is Cosmosm, right? So there has to be some kind of incentive structure, some kind of bounty, maybe some kind of reward for submitting um, some for submitting a random beacon, and 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 also this random beacon is expensive, expensive to verify. Uh, so one thing we're thinking of doing is to uh, is to implement this in an SDK Go module. Uh, so, um, so the gas will be less to verify. Um, another option is to build this into Tendermint itself and kind of like provide it as a service to uh, you know any any chain that wants that want that want that wants to use it. 
And uh, once again, this is the input that is fed into the shuffle algorithm. Um, okay. And um, so one, one more thing I wanted to mention is that uh, another potential way to, to, uh, to do this is to use uh, threshold decryption. Um, this is a bit beyond the scope of the talk because um, we have decided to go with the, the random shuffling approach. But this is probably another way you can do it, right? Um, in Cosmos and in Tendermint, you have a validator set. That validator set could be in control of a decryption key. So um, when the seller publishes the collection, they can encrypt uh, the IPFS CIDs, um, or uh, they can also you know, encrypt a shuffled version of the set. Uh, and then during the mint operation, um, the validator set can go and decrypt uh, either the token ID or the or the URI, and this is something you can only do in an app specific chain, and this is probably cheaper than verifying a random beacon. Um, so this is probably more of a of an advanced way of doing it, of doing it that we might explore a bit later. Okay. Anyway, folks, uh, that's all I had for my talk. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter. I am Shane3V on Twitter. Um, a bunch of people helped me out with this talk. So, um, uh, uh, you know, hats, hats off to them. And um, also, uh, you know, if you're interested in any of this stuff, if you're in interested in, in NFTs uh, with Cosmosm um, and mechanism design around NFTs, you know, please, please get in touch. Uh, you can also check us out at stargaze.zone. Thank you.